No. We're talking a lot about justice today. And uh, Dylan did a lot of time. So his name's Dylan Dallas. Um, and he actually interned at the church when he was uh, younger. Sunday afternoon. Hope you had a good afternoon. Hope it was relaxing. And hope it was productive. And I'm glad you can be here tonight as we strive to dive into the Minor Prophets once again and see what application has for us and see what it has to reveal to us about who our God is. Uh, to begin our class, let's begin in prayer. Father, we come before you and we're so thankful for this church family. Father, we understand that what we have here is unique. This is not everywhere in the country or in the world. Father, we know that we're blessed here to have so many people gather at one time to sing praises to you, to learn about you. We thank you for this community. Help us to never take it for granted. Father, we thank you for what you do in our lives, and we're thankful for your revealed word. 
Now you've given us Zephaniah. Help us to learn from it tonight. Help us to dive into it with open hearts and give us a renewed spirit to be zealous for the good work you've given us here in this world. Be about it. All these things we pray through Jesus. Amen. Well, you probably noticed the theme in the Minor Prophets uh, to this point in the class of at least that I've done so far. In all of the Minor Prophets, we see this continual theme of judgment and God making a case against His people. And I'll just be honest with you, the book of Zephaniah is no different. It's a book that highlights um, the people of Judah, their sin, and ultimately what God is going to do about it. And I'll be honest with you, this is a heavy book. If you read it, if you've read the three chapters in preparation for this class, you saw that it's a heavy book. God does not sugarcoat what's coming their way, what's coming for Judah. Um, it's not a book that's going to make it into VeggieTales anytime soon. It's not a book that says, if you do X, I'll forgive you. If you do Y, I'll have mercy on you. It is a book where God says, you've sinned and there's going to be consequences for that. The time has come for God to deal out judgment and retribution. When we typically think about God, put that aside, you know, put that on the back burner for just a second. When we typically think about God, what attributes come to our mind? You know, we're just going through our day. What attributes come to our mind? We think of love, we think of grace, we think of steadfastness, we think of this beauty of God. And is that a correct picture of God? <laughs> Yeah, it's a correct picture of God. And God is this God of love, this God of mercy and grace. But is that a complete picture of God? And it's not. It's not as we talked about this morning. There's more to God than love and grace. But God is a God of justice. He is a God of anger. He's a God that's not just going to sweep sins under the rug. And that's what Zephaniah, I hope we see, is pointing out what it helps us see about God. It helps us see a clear picture. That God is more than just a God, a God of grace and mercy, but He's a God who ultimately cannot buy, stand by and watch sin and do nothing. Before we dive into the book tonight, first let me say, as I've said the last couple classes, again, kind of preach for you tonight, um, a lot of lecture in my notes. You all have been making great comments. Let me just say, dicey comments at some times, but, but great comments. Great comments. And so continue to do that. Continue just to share your thoughts with me. I love that. That's what I love about teaching. And so if at any point, especially in our application, you think of something and how it applies to us, uh, feel free to raise your hand. Feel free to speak up and stop me. Go for it. Um, second thing, let me establish the context before we get too far into the book of Zephaniah. As I mentioned a moment ago, the primary audience, the recipients of this message, is the nation of Judah. And so God is going to give Zephaniah this message and it's going to be a message that's going to come in a very specific time. The word of the Lord, which came to Zephaniah, verse 1, look at the end of the verse. In the days of Hezekiah, in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah. That's a, those are kings that we recognize, correct? King Hezekiah, King Josiah, we're very familiar with those kings in the biblical narrative. If you know your Bible history, though, you know that this is very near to the end of the nation of Judah. After Josiah, there's going to be four kings, and they're going to reign for a total of 12 years. So this is, this is the end of Judah when Zephaniah comes on to the stage. Now, excuse me, now you might be thinking, why is God bringing this message now, during the reign of Josiah? Uh, Josiah, good king, bad king? Good king. I mean, if we could argue that, that Hezekiah and Josiah... This is one of the best times for the nation of Judah. Josiah is doing some amazing things. He's reforming the nation. He's tearing down idols. We see that again and again in 2 Kings 22. So, so why, why now? Why is God bringing this message? This message that doesn't say, if you repent, if you change, I'll spare you. But a message that says, I'm going to judge you and you're going to go into captivity. Well, let me offer three suggestions as to why this is. One... Idolatry is still rampant in the days of Josiah. Josiah is a good king. He's reforming the nation, but idolatry is still widespread. It's still common practice. The second thing I might add is, um, after Josiah, God in His infinite wisdom knows they're going to go right back to their old practices. Right after Josiah, the nation endures four kings who again are wicked, who are idolatrous, 
But but the thing I can say concretely is that during the time of Manasseh, the nation was so wicked, just so perverted, that God said, I've had enough. Regardless of what you do, this nation, this, this physical nation, it's, it's going to come to an end for a time. I think about 2 Kings 23, when, when God says to Josiah, before him there was no king like him who turned to the Lord with all his heart, with all his soul, with all his might, according to the law of Moses, nor did any arise after him. However, the Lord did not turn from his fierceness of his great wrath, with which his anger burned against Judah because of all the, provo the provocations with which Manasseh had provoked him. The Lord said, I will remove Judah also from my sight, as I have removed Israel. I will cast off Jerusalem, the city which I have chosen, and the temple of which I said, My name shall be there. Despite the efforts of Josiah, God understands it's not going to change. It's not going to last. And so because of Manasseh, because of the nation and their direction, God said to Josiah, enough's enough. And so this is the time, this is the setting of the prophet Zephaniah. And when he'll come onto the scene and pronounce this message of judgment. The book, if you're reading, it's only three chapters, and so it's not a lot. We could probably, if we have time, we may read through it later in the class. But, but it can be divided into three sections. The first section can be divided into God pronouncing judgment on Judah. God is going to make a case. He's going to pronounce judgment against Judah. And then the book moves in the second section to talk about God judging the nations. God is going to make it very clear that, that sin is not just noticed in Judah. That I'm not just paying attention to them, but sin doesn't go unnoticed anywhere. That I'm going to judge the nations around Judah. And in the last section, like all, well, I should say most of the minor prophets, is this beautiful message, this, this shift in the narrative that turns into a message of hope, a, a message of transformation, a message about a future remnant of God's people. And so that's the outlining of the book. It follows the pattern that most of the minor prophets do. Uh, but this morning, or this evening, excuse me, I want to focus application-wise on the first, the first section and the second section. I want to combine those because I think there's a lot of good stuff in Zephaniah, a lot of application that we can turn to and look to. You know, oftentimes we, we think, oh, we don't, we don't struggle with the problems that they struggled with. You know, that was so long ago, those minor prophets... You know, times are different now, but I hope you've noticed as we've gone through the class, especially in books like Jonah and books like Amos, the problems of then are still the problems of now, the problems that plague God's people in the book of Zephaniah and Amos and Joel are still the problems and the sins that plague God's people today, but maybe just take manifest in a little different ways. And the first thing I want to point out about God pronouncing judgment on Judah and the nations is is how God has said, I have, I've had enough. I've had enough, and I'm going to do something. I think about Zephaniah 1, verse 4. Zephaniah 1, verse 4. This is God directly um, talking about Judah and addressing Judah. He says, So I will stretch out my hand against Judah and against all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. I will cut off the remnant of Baal from this place and the names of the idolaters' priests, along with the priests. And those who bow down on the housetops of the host of heaven those who bow down and swear to the Lord, yet swear by Milka, and those who have turned back from following the Lord, and those who have not sought the Lord <coughs> or inquired of Him. God is saying ju judgment is coming for Judah, and it's not going to be pleasant. This isn't going to be a, a light-hearted slap on the wrist, but this is going to be complete devastation. Just a few verses later, in verse 14, <coughs> near is the great day of the Lord, near and coming very quickly, Listen, the day of the Lord. In it the warrior cries out bitterly. A day of wrath is that day. A day of trouble and distress. A day of destruction and desolation. A day of darkness and gloom. A day of clouds and thick darkness. Again, this is not Veggie Tales. This is a heavy book. This is God is going to bring complete and utter destruction against the mightiest warriors that Judah has to offer. It's going to be a day day of the Lord that the prophets have told about for so long, for decades now, into the biblical narrative. So in chapter 2, chapter 1 addresses that, but in chapter 2, God addresses the fact that no other nations are going to escape judgment. Just skim, 
skim through the text with me, and we won't take time to talk about this. Verse 4, there's Gaza, and Ashkelon, and Ashod, and Ekron. They're all going to face judgment. Verse 5, the Cherizites and the Philistines will face judgment. Verse 8, Moab and Ammon. Verse 12, Ethiopia, Assyria, Nineveh. They're all going to face judgment. Chapter 2, God is making a declaration. A declaration that no one is free from the consequence of sin. And so the question we need to ask as we read chapter 1 and chapter 2 is why is God so unhappy with these nations? This isn't like the other minor prophets. This isn't a message that says, you know, if you turn to me, if you render your heart to me, if you, you, you have the solemn assembly like we see in Joel, I'll relent. But this is a message of complete and utter destruction. <laughs> and so we need to ask, what's different? Why is God so unhappy with Israel, or with Judah, and why is God going to do this? And like we've seen with the other minor prophets, um, what we're going to see in this book is what we'll see in the New Testament. And again, the sins that plague God's people then are sins that plague people, God's people now. And so, so all the application we're going to have, the entire case God is going to make against Judah, God can make the same case against us today if we're not careful, and if we're not attentive. Does anyone have any comments about the narrative before we bring up the case, before we dive into what exactly Judah is doing to invoke the Lord's anger? Any, any comments about anything so far? Go ahead. Um, the fact that, as he mentioned earlier, as you, the first verses said, Israel had been taken away. Mm -hmm. I mean, just that. They had seen that amazing yeah. destruction yeah. of Israel. That should have caused them to repent. Yeah. Well, it, it's just, uh, you know, God has given us not only that, but so many signs to this point. We, remember we talked about <coughs> in, in Joel and in Amos, you know, God has sent the, the locusts and the fire. He's doing all these things and he's just trying to wake them up. But Judah has become so desensitized to that. Even God taking his people, his nation, Israel, and wiping them out completely by the Assyrians. They're just completely blind to it. And man, there's a great application in that for us. You know, our, eye, our eyes open to the obvious, where we become so prideful, so arrogant, that we don't think anything's going to happen. And we see that that's one of the applications we're talking about. Um, they had stagnant hearts, thinking God wouldn't act. Anything, anything else? All right, well, let's dive into what the case is. Um, the case doesn't differ from... Uh, too much from the other minor prophets, but there is some, some good stuff that I think we can learn from tonight. The first thing we need to recognize is that Judah was idolatrous. The first case that God is going to make against Judah is that Judah is a nation that is just idolatrous. When you read the biblical narrative, you especially see this in the narrative of Josiah, what's going on in the nation, what they're practicing. But we also see it in the book of Zephaniah. Look back in the text at verse number 4. Zephaniah 1 and verse 4. We read this earlier, but, but pay attention to the names, the nouns of, of this verse. So I will stretch out my hand against Judah and against all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And I will cut off the remnant of Baal from this place and the names of the idolatrous priests along with the priests. And those who bow down on the housetops and on the, house, or the housetops of the host of heaven and those who bow down and swear to the Lord, yet swear by Malcolm. And those who have turned back from following the Lord, and those who have sought not sought the Lord or inquired of Him. What idols are the nation of Judah worshiping? What do we see? Malcolm, one. That's the god of the Amorites. What else? Baal. Yeah. We have we have the two main players in the narrative of Judah that we see over and over again in the biblical narrative. We have Baal and we have Malcolm again, the god of the Amorites, and. And we see not only that the, the people are, are worshiping them, but we have these idolatrous priests. And again, it's just this widespread, this rampant idolatry. And so because of this, God's anger is just going to burn against them. And it should be no surprise to us, because what are the first two commandments of God's law? No other God. No other God. And, and the carbon images, right? No other God. Don't make carbon images. This is something that matters a lot to God. That we don't turn to these other gods. We don't trust in them. God hates it when we do that. He hates when we have these idols in our life that have absolutely no power 
no stability, no security, but we turn to them, we trust in them, we devote ourselves to them. And so one of the reasons that God is going to completely destroy Judah at this time is ultimately because they trusted idols. Uh, I think about Zephaniah 2, verse 11. Zephaniah 2, verse 11. I'm not sure if it's up on the screen. It is. And one of the reasons God's going to come, He's going to deal out retribution in such just this graphic way is because they trust in idols. And He wants to make a statement about it. The Lord will be terrifying to them, for He will starve all of the gods of the earth, and all the coastlands of the nations will bow down to Him, everyone from His own place. What statement is God making with this destruction? With the Babylonians coming and, and taking Judah, what statement is God making to them as they worship these other gods? They're, they're no good. They're not going to save you. It's no good. They're not going to save you. They're, they're nothing in comparison to me. The reason why God's going to display His anger, His wrath, is basically to say, your gods can't do anything about it. Your gods can't do anything about me because I'm the one true God. Why this is a problem for Judah, it's certainly a problem for us. I don't think any, anyone would argue about that. Jesus tells us that this is a problem we're going to deal with. As he talks about how, how we can't serve two masters. You have either served God or you either served money or you insert any idol into that. We can try to serve idols and money and popularity and career and Jesus says that's not sustainable. That's not going to work. And so we need to recognize that this is, this is something we might struggle with. What are some gods that we can trust in today? That we can put our dependency in, we can put our trust in, our security in, that we can turn to and devote ourselves to. That we need to be careful that we don't. Because then we might face a very similar situation where God is going to say, I'm going to have to display some judgment, some wrath. Because you need to recognize that they're no good. They're not going to work. What are some idols we can trust in? Money. Money, that's the obvious answer. That's what Jesus would say in this text. You can't serve God and you can't serve money. In what ways can money become our idol? Is it wrong for a Christian to have a job? No. Okay, so we need to, we need to figure out what, what's the problem? What, what can go wrong? When does money become an idol? It takes precedence. Go ahead. Sorry. When it takes precedence. When it takes precedence. What, do you, what do you mean by that? Over time of service, yep. time with family, yeah. time with... Yeah, absolutely. What were you going to say, Mr. When it comes to the first thing. Yeah, when it becomes the top of the list. That's when money becomes a problem. It's not wrong for a Christian to have a job. It's not wrong for you don't work, to work. You don't eat. You don't work, you don't eat. And that's a biblical principle. We're not supposed to be lazy, the sloth. But when money becomes a priority, when, when it puts God on the back burner, that's when, that's when the problems arise. So we need to be careful about that. It's really easy to become, in just the world we live in, I don't know if you feel the pressure that the world is putting on you. I, I certainly feel it as someone who's about to get their bachelor's degree and about to go into the workforce. This, the world is telling you if you don't have this car, you don't have this house, you don't matter. Right? And I don't know if anyone else feels that pressure from the world, but I certainly do as a young, as a young man. What else? What else? What can be an idol? Go ahead. Uh, political power. What do you mean by that? <laughs> Just take a look at the way our world. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The whole world is torn apart by that. Yeah. It, it, and even among brethren. And we see that where where the God of the presidency, the God of the political power, whatever it might be, the God of the Senate race, the God of the con the, the, the Congress race, becomes the number one thing I'm focused on. Uh, I remember I remember, uh, I think I can tell the story. I, I try to have a rule where I, I wait two or three years and I can tell kind of sensitive stories. Um, um, I remember I was working at a church a, a couple years ago and and we had some members who, who weren't coming for COVID. They, they weren't coming for COVID, I respect that. I think that was the appropriate thing for them to do with their health, health situation. Um, our preacher ran into them actually out at the voting booth as they were in the midst of all these people, hundreds of people, and the, the preacher ran up to him and said, you know, I thought you guys were trying to you know, kind of COVID quarantine. Okay, they'll say what they said. It's too important. You know, we had to get out. We had to exercise our democratic right. I've seen it even in my lifetime. People who, who make the God of political, yeah, their number one priority, and it takes precedence all over these other things. And we see that all in, in a vast number of ways. But yeah, that that when I when I heard about that when I was there working there, it just shocked me that that it can become so important over all these other things. Go ahead. Well, along with that, just hoping in the 
hoping in the, the idea of America, <coughs> you know, and I, or conservative fiscal policies, which I'm all about, yep. but that is not what's going to save us. Mm -hmm. and ultimately, that's not our redemption. It's yep. not what gives us the foundation for our lives yep. or, uh, or hope. Yep. It's not where it comes from. Because you can have all the conservative fiscal policies in the world, but mm -hmm. if everyone is confused about their gender, mm -hmm. and what is it that I'm supposed to do here on this earth at all, and I'm just going to fill my time with trash on Netflix, fill my mm -hmm. mind with that, yeah. we're not going anywhere. Yeah. And you can have the president that you want, but that is not going to mm -hmm. help, which I think the point about Josiah mm -hmm. is a really good one in that context, too. We might have a president that comes and does reforms yeah. that we want, but Josiah did that. Yeah. And God said, that doesn't help. Mm -hmm. Because in the hearts of those people, they were too far gone already. Mm -hmm. They did not serve God. Josiah went into their homes and took idols out of their houses. Mm -hmm. But that still wasn't <laughs> enough. Yeah. Uh, so it's it's what's happening in the hearts of the nation. And we have to put our hope in the right place. Mm -hmm. And anything that we put our hope in that's not true, it will be removed. Yeah. And it will help us learn. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, we need to, I, I, love, I love everything you say, I won't, I won't comment too much on that, but uh, I think we all need to recognize that the problems of this world are not red or blue, but they are Jesus' problems, and that only Jesus can solve and fix. Um, we need to be really mindful of that, because that changes the way in which we look at the world. Is King Jesus the one we're looking towards? Is he the one we're serving or against? Is just red or blue become an idol in our life, the God of the presidency? We need to ask ourselves, am I more ready to defend him, the man in the presidency, pastor, president, then defend and proclaim King Jesus in my life. That's a question we need to ask ourselves all the time to see where where is he on that on that list. What other idols? We'll do one more and then go ahead. I was going to say technology. Ooh, what do you mean by that? <laughs> um, well, we, a lot of times we use it as a replacement for God. Yeah. Um, we any, anything that we put in place of God is yep. an idol. Um, you know, I think like one of the neighboring nations of Israel, their technology during their time was to be able to build houses and cliffs mm -hmm. and things of that nature. And God was like, your technology is worthless. Yeah. It's happening. And I think sometimes we should be humble as well. Yeah. Think about our technology. Mm -hmm. um, you know. And also the amount of resources we might sometimes put into owning, like the nicest, newest gadget. We even use it as a status symbol. Uh -huh. and there's a lot of things. Sure yeah, my, my roommate came up to me last night and said, Carson, I'm getting the iPhone 14. I go, Joel, what, what, what phone do you have? He goes, I have the 12. I'm like, why, man? Like, it's the same thing. And, but again, we buy into that because it becomes our idol. Uh, uh, fun activity. I don't usually do spur of the moment, off the cuff activities. Pull, if you've got an iPhone, pull it out. We're not going to share anything, but I want to go to settings. I want to do, this is good for us to do every now and then, isn't it? There's a, there's a quote that, that's been said many, many a times. To know who the idol of your life is, you need to look at where your wallet and where your time is going. And so if you go up to settings and you look at usage and where your, your, your screen time, you can actually see where your attention is going on your phone. You can see how many hours a day you average on every single app that you have on your phone. Just looking at my phone, I'm kind of weary. I'm kind of concerned. I spend a lot more time on that than I do on other things in my life. And I think that's good for us to reflect on, isn't it, every now and then. Uh, we, we can serve our phones, we can serve Facebook, we can serve Instagram, uh, we can just serve the need to have technology in our life and making that my goal and my focus, have that iPhone 14. You, know. you guys know? I was just going to say one thing, I'm guilty of this as far as yeah, me, but like, me too. when I hear there's a hurricane coming, <laughs> like, do I pray to God and say, you know, God, please protect us? I have I, I, yeah, being, my go -to is. yeah, being in a lot of uh, upper division classes, I'm having a lot of temptations with this hurricane. I don't know what to pray for right now. <laughs> Do I want school to get canceled? I, I don't know. Um, I don't think Florida College would, though. So it's uh, it's okay. But uh, there was something something else over here. You guys got something? Go ahead. Well, I was going to say experts. <laughs> yeah. I'm so sick of hearing from experts yeah. in America. When you start to say experts say this, that's I start going the opposite direction. Yeah. And I think during COVID, like I was like, I'm really overhearing what experts have to say about this. Yeah. Um, but you know, and all you ha all the newscasters have to do is use the word expert. Mm -hmm. 
and it seems like we don't have we don't care who the expert is. Like we don't have to know anything about who they're quoting, even their name, like what they're like we don't know anything about it. We just take it because the expert said it, and we can really fall into that. Um, and especially when it comes to psychological things, we can I think undermine the power and the spirit of God by trusting in what all these experts who probably have an atheistic worldview are telling us about how to be a self you know self-actualized person, how to raise our kids, how to have good marriage, blah blah blah. There's a lot of junk and lies that comes directly from Satan through experts. So so just be very careful about that. Yeah we need we need to be careful about that. Go ahead. I'm just thinking along with the expert I know people who decide that because this person knows more biblically than them, that anything that comes out of their mouth yep. has to be the truth, and then they don't do their own work. Mm-hmm. And so then they can just listen to that person and absorb it all, and they could not, maybe there's wrong in there, mm-hmm. but you can easily fall into the laziness of, yep. well, this person's been a Christian longer than me, so yep. everything they say is correct. And that's ultimately, I think, what idolatry, one of the reasons that we are so prone to be idolatrous, it all comes down to the idols of my life, the idols that they were serving, they don't make demands like our God does. And so it's very easy to to lean back, to relax, oh, yep, I serve the God of Baal, you know, and He doesn't demand anything of me, He just gives. He just gives. It's very easy, very easy to be lazy. And that's one of the reasons why we serve these idols sometimes. But, uh, yeah, no, I, I love your comment. What else? Go ahead. With uh, some of these idols in here and some of the ones mentioned there, they can become uh, kind of obvious before uh, putting them in front of God. Yep. Uh, but in the next verse, in verse 12, it says, Punish the men who are settled in complacency, mm-hmm. who say in their heart, The Lord will not do good, mm-hmm. nor will he do evil. Yep. They're basically, and then it talks about how he's going to take their goods away and it'll become someone else's. Uh, treasures or someone else's victories. So, the idea there is we could be serving an idol and not even realize it because we aren't putting something else on a pedestal. Mm -hmm. We're just becoming complacent in our service to God. Mm -hmm. And thus, our idol just becomes whatever, lack of interest, lack of effort, not seeking the truth for Mm -hmm. ourselves, And I think that in our uh, culture today, uh, especially like around like the Bible Belt area of America, and sorry if I sound offensive because I'm from Canada, but this is my observation, (laughs) that it's almost like a cultural norm in town to go to church and to be a part of a worship group and things like that. And so it becomes just, that's what we do, and there's not really a resistance there. And the danger is then just to be complacent, go along with it, do all the things everybody else is doing, but not really dig in for yourself, not really set down uh, your firm walls on what she's actually saying. No, that's, that's a great point. I don't have too much to add to that, especially on this, this topic of, of idols and everything. It's very easy to say, oh yeah, I, you know, I've got no idols in my life. I'm serving God. I'm, I'm coming to church. I'm, I'm doing these things. But when in reality, you know, we're just kind of doing them out of habit. We're doing them out of complacency. It's just the norm, and that's not serving. That's not devotion. That's not. That's not love. That's not what God wants. Um, so, anything else? Well, that verse twelve gets into one of the other things that I want to talk about tonight. Anything else, idol wise? Our wives or our husbands? Yep, family. Family. Absolutely. Jesus will talk about that a lot. You know, Jesus says these kind of radical things. You know, who ever loves, you know, mother and father more than me? He says these radical things, but there's a truth in there, isn't there, that we can place these things above King Jesus. So we need to be very careful that we don't. That's a great idol. That's a hard idol. Um, one that that it takes a lot of, a lot of self-reflection to recognize. Anything else? Status. Status. Uh, again, it goes back to that iPhone 14. Are we getting an iPhone 14? Because, you know, it's just like a supercomputer. You know, I've done my research, the gigawatts, the, the data. No, you get an iPhone 14 because you want the iPhone 14. Like, you want to you wanna say, I've got the iPhone. That's the reason people get it. Again, it goes back to this need for status, this need for, 
for recognition in our society. Uh, I, know, I don't know anything about I don't know anything about phones. I'm just being honest with y'all. I don't even I don't even look. I, I'll just get red. Um, yeah, this is need for for status and this need for just recognition in society. It becomes an idol. It becomes an idol that just, just controls every aspect of our life. Go ahead. Another one is uh, the idol of privacy, of like holding fellow Christians at a distance, uh, keeping, protecting our own time, protecting our own um, will of what we want to do, what we want to accomplish, and not opening up to serve others. Yeah, I thought about that one. That sort of ways an idol. It's idol privacy. And Man, that, that's good. I, I got to think about that one because that, that's something I might use in the future. But it, certainly, that, there's an idea there that that <coughs> as we exclude ourselves from others, try to keep private and do our, it becomes an idol. It becomes something that we strive for in life. I like that. I haven't thought about that one before. Well, you shouldn't like it. <laughs> excuse me. Excuse me. <laughs> I don't like it. I, I hate it. I hate it. But, uh, <laughs> stop provoking. That's a better. better. Don't tell Don everyone. Let's move on to the second application, uh, while I'm still ahead for the moment. The second application is, is something that I think is the most applicable in the book of Zephaniah. This is something that as I was reading, it really just stood out to me. Something that I hadn't picked up before, haven't seen. And it's one of those verses that is really easy to skim by if we're not careful to. It's Zephaniah 1 verse 8. And it will come about on the day of the Lord's sacrifice, that it will punish the princes, the king's sons, and all who clothe themselves in foreign garments. I will punish those who clothe themselves in foreign garments. That's a really interesting statement in our Bibles, isn't it? It's one of those statements that you kind of read very easily. Again, you could just skim past, skim over, and pay no attention to. But as I was preparing this class, it really stood out to me. Something I hadn't seen, something I hadn't considered before. The verse was challenging, both on an intellectual level, but then on a spiritual level. Intellectually, you know, I looked at this verse and I think, what's going on, right? As Americans, typically all of our clothes are exported. This is not something that is, you know, a problem for us. Probably the, the clothing you're wearing right now is from different countries. We're, we're not, um, we wear foreign clothes all the time. And so intellectually, I, I was challenged by this verse, but when I read commentary after commentary, it all describes, they all are in uh, agreement about what is going on, why this is so sinful, why God cares about this. So here's what the commentary said. I don't think, okay, it's not up there on the screen, but uh, oh, there's stagnant hearts. Um, here's what all the commentary said. I had three for you. It says, the priests and the leaders of Judah were ashamed of their national identity. So they loved to dress in foreign apparel. They wanted to be like the worldly nations around them as much as possible. Another commentator said, The princes who attired themselves in costly garments imported them from abroad, partly for the sake of luxury and partly to integrate themselves with the other foreign great nations. Homer Haley would say in his Minor Prophets commentary, he says, They had forsaken the customs of their own divinely appointed <coughs> kingdom, and they had adopted those of a heathen people. So what's going on here in Judah? Why is God so disappointed? Why is He so angry that they're wearing foreign clothing? What, what's the problem here? What's going on? Go ahead. Well, if it's the priests, that's a big problem because yeah. they had their own specific clothing that they were supposed to wear. Yeah, they had their specific clothing that they had to wear the priest. And that's going with it. More broadly, let's think of just the nation. It says all those who clothe themselves in foreign garments. What's the, what's the problem? I mean, is it wrong to you know export from Syria? Is it wrong to export from like what? Is this like an economic problem for like you? What what's going on here? What's the deeper issue? Well, throughout the Old Testament, God is telling them to set themselves apart yeah. from the other nations. And if they're going to go and just look exactly like the other nations, they're not going to shine. It's something different than yeah. God's people. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. No. Go ahead. Um, you're you're right. <laughs> if you're tied up with like your motor cars, your some people just see you in the car. Yeah. Instead of Go ahead. I was going to piggyback with the this comments. <coughs> one of the really important aspects was them being set apart. And one of the 
important aspects of that was the clothing, mm -hmm. especially the way it was constructed, not mixing linen and wool. There was a specific mm -hmm. commandment that something a foreign nation would have not abided by, and like, that there was a possibility that they were ignoring some of those requirements. Yeah. So all, all of you, all of you are right. There, there's this problem is is you know, when it, or in Judah when it comes to the priest, when it comes to just the everyday person that they look at the regulations God has given them, they look at the clothing that, that is normal to their society, that's been acceptable, and then they look at the other nations. And what do they say when they look at the other nations? It's better, it's luxurious, I want to be like them, because, because they stood out in the way they dressed. As you, as you said, the way they dressed was different, it was set apart, it didn't look like everyone else, the priests had their own garments. And so the people of Judah thought, yeah, I don't want to do this anymore. I want to dress how everybody else dresses. I don't want to be set apart. I don't want to stand out. I want to live it up in the world and wear these luxurious outfits from other, from other nations. There's some rich application there for us, isn't there? Again, this is just a verse we could, we could skip over, not think twice about. But I think this is one of the most profound, most thought-provoking verses from the book of Zephaniah. Again, we're, we're called, as someone mentioned a moment ago, we are called to be set apart, aren't we? Matthew 5 would say we are, we're light, we're salt, we're supposed to be different. Uh, the epistles talk about how we're pilgrims, we're sojourners, we're aliens. They use that vocabulary to describe us countless times. 1 Peter 2 would say that you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into wonderful light. And, and simply, I, I share all of those verses, all those ideas. As we all know, we're set apart, we're different, we're not supposed to be like everyone else. In what ways are we supposed to be different from the world? Well, sorry, just real quick, going back to who is dressing differently, yeah. the princes, the king's son, in foreign garments. Yeah. That's treason. Yeah. They're dressing up as another nation mm -hmm. and uh, in a position of authority, giving submission over to another nation mm -hmm. and acknowledging that that nation is who I'm following now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and that's, that's the root problem that we see when we make all these compromises is that when we put on foreign clothing, um, figuratively, we're saying, I serve them, not you. Uh, my allegiance is there, um, not here. Uh, go ahead. I, you asked, what, what are, how are we supposed to be different? Yeah. Or to be content, mm -hmm. one thing. Yeah. I see covetousness in that verse where they're having things they don't have in their country, uh, other foreign clothes. Yeah. That, that's, that's something they're coveting. There's something wrong with the heart. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so on that topic of contentment, right? Um, God has called us to be content. He's called us to be content with what we have. Is that the mindset of the world? Is that the mindset that the world is pushing right now on young people? What is, what is the world telling? What is the world telling college graduates? What is the world telling those in the business and the workplace? What is the world, world saying? More is better, right? Let's get as much money as we can. Let's not be content. Let's keep moving up. Let's make these strategic moves again and again and again. Don't be content with that job you have now. Keep working. If you have that car, that's ah, all right. Yeah, it's all right, but we'll work towards the next one. Again, go back to the iPhone. I'm not going to describe it this time, but, <laughs> but again, the world is saying, I will keep trying. Get the best one you can. Go ahead. Well, there's a great deception, I think, that, I don't know, it's been around for a long time, but the idea of progress mm -hmm. uh, and that society is always pushing towards progress. Yeah. And if the idea that progress is pure, that there's pure progress. That doesn't exist. Because you can look at all the technological inventions that have been made in the last few years. With each one, there's a trade-off. There's something you lose. Yep. Even though we all have an iPhone now, we're all dumber. Right? I mean, there's research that... Because we don't, we don't use our brains in the same way anymore um, for information. We, we put it all on our phone. So, there, and then there's other kinds of addictive things that come from these technologies and other downsides that we're hearing more and more about. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't pure progress yep. to get an iPhone. Mm -hmm. And then there's all the stuff with social media. Progress! Mm -hmm. Well, does any of us think that social media is like purely great? Mm -hmm. I don't think so. Yep. So there's 
there's always a trade-off. And C.S. Lewis calls it chronological snobbery, where we think our time, we're the smartest, the people 100 years ago were done, and we have made progress and said, but we're, we're not getting anywhere. The, the, earth, the earth goes in circles, it goes in circles around the sun, <laughs> getting anywhere. It's not, we're not making progress, unless yeah. we are moving towards the future. And again, tying that back into this idea of how can we put on foreign, foreign clothes, uh, you know, going on along this line, you brought up experts, you brought up this, this technological advance. Uh, the world says, hey, boast, be proud of what you've got, you know, proclaim to the world, we did this, right? Is that how the Christian is supposed to respond in this world? Is that what God wants us to be, these proud people on pedestals who are saying, look what I did all the time? Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> um, no, it's not. And so there's some ways we can wear foreign clothing. You all know this. Just be aware of this. Be attentive to this. The way we dress. We want to fit in with everyone else. That's the practical um, lesson from this. Do we want to fit in at school or in the workplace so we compromise the way we speak? We put on foreign clothes in that regard. Maybe our priorities in life, as we talked about again and again in this class. Maybe I, I tell my friends, you know, all about these business ventures I have going on and, and not about what's what I'm doing in the church. Maybe we try to, to steer our priorities to fit in with everyone else. Maybe it's our boundaries in life. What, whatever it might be, we need to ask ourselves, do we put on foreign clothes? Man, we have so much to get to, and I am not teaching on Wednesday, and so I'm trying to think. The last application is stagnant hearts. Um, we talked about this. I won't go into depth with it with the final minutes that we have. But in Zephaniah 1, verse 12, it will come about at that time that I will search Jerusalem with lamps, and I will punish the men who are stagnant in spirit or complacent in spirit, who say in their hearts, the Lord will not do good or not do evil. There's a sin in the days of Zephaniah of complacency, of these, the stagnancy, the stagnant hearts of the people. They have a mindset that says, God isn't going to do good, God isn't going to do evil. Basically, this mindset that, that pictures God is he's sitting back in the chair, he doesn't care what I'm doing, he's not going to do anything about it, the world is what it is, I do what I do. That's this mindset that goes on at, in the time of Zephaniah. And again, just reading that, the, the application is pretty obvious, obvious for us to see, for us to understand. It can be easy because God is a deity, he's not physical. To think that and to, as we look at the injustice of the world, as it just continues to go on and on and on, yeah, God isn't going to do anything about that. He's not present. He's not going to do good. He's not going to do evil. He becomes stagnant and complacent in heart. And, has, and as we do that, our actions will soon manifest actions that lack accountability. Um, but we need to realize that as we, we looked at the back of this morning with Zephaniah, even though it may seem like God is doing nothing, even though it may seem like God is not in control, God will be a lot of retribution and God will be a lot of justice. The last section is a section of, of hope. In Zephaniah 3, verse 12, let's read this together. Zephaniah 3, verse 12. But I will leave among you a humble and lowly people, and they will take refuge in the name of the Lord. The remnant of Israel will do no wrong and tell no lies, nor will a deceitful tongue be found in their mouths. For they will feed and lie down with no one to make them tremble. Shout for joy, O daughters of Zion. Shout in triumph, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughters of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away His judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies, the kings of Israel. The Lord is in your midst. You will feel the fear of disaster no more. We'll stop. Showcasing his love or his justice and his need to deal with it and retribution, but he's showcasing his love and his ultimate grace and mercy for his people. So that's the book of Zephaniah. Thank you so much for your time. A lot, lot in there, but thank you. Thank you for your time.